Hello, halflings! George Primavera here to tell you about Three Black Halflings, a conversational comedy podcast hosted by Jasper Cartwright, Olivia Kennedy, and Jeremy Cobb, three nerdy friends with strong opinions and even stronger charisma scores. Having grown up in different corners of the world, they bring a diverse range of perspectives as they talk about their experiences as people of color in pop culture fandoms, D&D, and the TTRPG community. Born of a love of all things nerdy, all three of them share personal and often hilarious stories, challenge typical fantasy tropes, and tackle diversifying fantasy, all whilst discussing the things they love. From Lord of the Rings to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, playing your first tabletop role-playing game, or advice for seasoned adventurers, there's something for everyone. They've brought on an array of guests from all around the roleplay community and beyond, including Christina Ariel, Brendan Lee Mulligan, Jake Hurwitz, Lou Wilson, and many more. The list goes on and on. Join them in their quest to explore diversity in the incredible worlds of D&D and pop culture through thought-provoking conversations and good times. Subscribe to Three Black Halflings on Apple, Spotify, Pocket Casts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Monday and Thursday. So long, Shire folk! So, what's the mark? The Eye of Kithiska. From the world of Dragon Age comes a new tale. The eye was crafted centuries ago by a powerful dreamer. Listen to me. You've been tricked. We have to put this back and leave. I'm sorry, but I won't let you pay for my mistakes. The eye will destroy us. Dragon Age. Vows and Vengeance. Listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Welcome to the Re-Slayer's Take. I'm George Primavera. And I'm Nick Williams. In this podcast, George and I lead a group of players through an exciting improvised adventure in Exandria, the magical world of Critical Role. We're playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but you won't need to know the rules to follow along. All you need to know is that nothing the players do is scripted or planned, and their fates are determined by their own cleverness and the random chance of rolling a 20-sided die. You can listen to new episodes of The Reslayer's Take every Monday, anywhere you stream podcasts. Or if you want to listen to the podcast two weeks early and uninterrupted by ads, join Beacon at beacon.tv. Last but certainly not least, if you're enjoying the story, please consider leaving a rating and review. Your feedback might inspire someone new to join this adventure. Now, without further ado, welcome, welcome to, to The, the Reslayer's Take. The Reslayer's Take stand at the edge of Ugelberg, once a great mountain peak, but now, after the ensuing earthquake caused by the explosive pose of our heroes, it now resembles an unvolcanic caldera. As they stand at the top of this mountain, everybody make a perception check. 18. 9. 8. 21. 10. Frog and Farah, you spot enormous white lobster-like creatures coming out of the burrows below. They crawl up the walls like spiders, their tails with big stingers in the back wavering slightly. And as they get up to the top of the mountain, they pass by you, moving towards the pile of rock that is the hollowed out mountain, disappearing within holes in it as they reclaim their previous habitat, though it has changed quite significantly. The officials, they are returning. Hera, should I punch him? For the sake of revenge? Frog, my legs are like jello. They cannot move. You must be my vengeance. I need you to hit Fera as hard as you can. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here's the thing. Remember before when you were like, hey, if something happens to me, I need you to kill me. I was like, oh, I'm not going to let the lobsters take her alive. So you're saying you did it on purpose? What's wrong with you? I I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Farah, roll a deception check. Hira, roll an insight check. Nat 20 for a total of 23. 23. Hira and Farah stare at each other. There is something unspoken as both of their eyes narrow. See, I I knew I could rely on you. Just know that um, next time, maybe not a big rock. And also, (laughs) you couldn't kill me. (laughs) You failed. (laughs) I might need to choose someone else for the death pact. (laughs) 
maybe your glasses fucked up <laughs> maybe you could <laughs> i mean you could see <laughs> or maybe you have a soft spot for me couldn't do it no i could um so no punching necessary no she's already half dead anyway after that troll perhaps we would be able to tend to our wounds if we return to the tavern i think that's a good idea Timpani, still with Hira over his shoulder, having pivoted so that she could be face to face with each person she talked to, ties a rope off to the piton, still embedded in the cliff face, and begins rappelling down with Hira. As they do, Hira mutters, you smell like a stable. It's kind of comforting. Hey, you're welcome. Hmm. Everybody make an athletics or acrobatics check with advantage, except for Hira. Nat 20. 23. 26. Four. Farah follows the rest of the Reslayers as they climb down the rope and immediately loses her grip from exhaustion. Remembering that Frog still has the ability to fly thanks to the flying potion, she lets go of the rope and reaches out for Farah. Roll an athletics check. Eight. Frog misses Farah and she goes flying past her. Norbert holds on to the rope with one hand and pushes off of the cliff to try to catch Pharaoh with the other. Roll an athletics check with advantage. 19. Uh, I gotcha. Uh, thanks. You're really strong. I woke out. The Reslayers take finally make their way down the still harrowing cliffside. As they approach the ground, Norbert noticeably sets Pharaoh down further up than when he has to climb down himself and the Reslayers find their feet on solid ground. Everybody not too loud. I think Kira dozed off on the way down. <sighs> yes, three more cups of pudding, please. Frog turns to Norbert. Let's go see your friends. Can I get a ride? Of course, Norbert. It's a short walk now to get back into the town, and above you, the putrid yellow cloud layer thins even more. The sun is starting to make its first appearance in Seedfeld in quite a while. Frog feels tiny sobs coming from the back of her metal body as Norbert tries to keep a brave face for his new friends. But it has been so long since he's seen the sun in his home. Frog discreetly reaches up and gives Norbert a quick pat on the head. Oh. Oh. As you walk into the still abandoned town, the wind gibbons, hoot at you from the surrounding rooftops. The attitude of the monkeys seems to have changed. Rather than being outwardly confrontational, they seem to be having a little celebration of their own, throwing gems back and forth as though they are playthings. Farah searches the ground for any dropped gems. There are several. She picks them up. This is amazing. We have won the respect of the wind gibbons. A door at the far end of Seedfeld bashes open. No bats. Zora! Everybody, come quick, Norbert is back. All of the Mega Magic Paladins, now restored as the curse has lifted, stream out of the building, rush to Norbert, and immediately surround him. Norbert gingerly climbs off of Frog's back and takes in the sight of his heroes, finally returning back to the people he knew they once were. We've done it! And don't worry, we've kept the dagger safe. But we have defeated Ugelberg. We knew you could do it. Let us give three cheers for Norbert and his new friends. Hip hip, huzzah! Hip hip, huzzah! Hip hip, huzzah! Following the Mega Magic Paladins is a very tired Poogs, clutching the spectral beads in his hands. Ah, oh, hey guys, how was uh, how was the mountain? I see things are starting to clear up. Did it all go pretty good? Yeah. You should have seen it. Hira did this really cool fire trick. Oh, cool. Can you do it again? She's uh, all tuckered out from doing the cool fire trick. Vera hit me in the head with a rock. What? It was an altruistic move. Oh, no, your horn. Yeah, she broke it. If I'm Hira the Hopeful, she should be Vera the Rock Chucker. Yeah, we'll workshop that. Why don't you just go back to sleep? Okay. Thank you for keeping them safe, Pooks. You've done an amazing job. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, No problem. 
a little bit ago, they all seem to just kind of come back to their senses and everything's been pretty easy since then, but it was a pretty rough time back here. The wind-given leader stares at Poogs from an adjacent rooftop, narrows his eyes, and gives him a subtle nod. Poogs returns the nod respectfully. Seems like it was pretty eventful here. I think if you had gone with us, you would have been bored. Really? Because you all look like pretty bad. Frog's got a whole bunch of weird scratches on her body. Here is missing a horn. Farah, you're covered in spores. It's better than it looks. Timpani puts on a brave face for Poogs and smiles, revealing a couple missing teeth. Yeah, buddy, it was all pretty a-okay. Whoa. Farah enters the tavern and sees the cots that are now unoccupied. She collapses in one of them. Hey, Poogs. I can fly for a little bit. You want to go for a ride? Poogs stares into the middle distance. I think I've done enough flying through the air today. There's a mocking hooting from the wind gibbons. They're calling you a little tossable melon, is that? Did they pick you up and throw you around? Let's just move past it, okay? Anyway, Norbert, I used this to its maximum effectiveness, I think. Poogs takes off a sweat-soaked sweatband and hands it back to Norbert. Oh, thank you so much. I can feel the hard work. This is called sweat equity. Do you want to go take a rest in the tavern? Norbert, is that okay? Yeah, I think we could all use a bit of healing, but luckily the Mega Magic Paladins are back up and about. They might be able to help us out. Yeah, of course, Norbert. We will watch the perimeter while you and your friends rest, yeah? Oh, that reminds me. Timpani shifts Hira on his shoulder so that he can reach down to his side. I believe this belongs to you. Timpani holds out the blue dagger to Linus, the blue paladin. Oh, thank you. I see it is well used. I don't know about that. Uh, it's not really my thing, but it did really help us out in a pinch, so thank you very much for lending it to us. You are most welcome. He then grabs the green dagger off of Hira's belt and hands it to Finn. And I'm sure if she were awake, she'd also say thank you as well. Finn walks forward to take the dagger. Oh, we are very grateful. Can I do anything in return? Perhaps a round of autographs? They sell for quite a pretty penny at local conventions and the like. <laughs> Ooh, do it, do it, do it! We would be honored. Timpani smiles at the group and then brings Hira into the tavern and puts her down on a cot. Frog looks to the pink paladin. Um, Sir Toby? Yeah? This was a great boon. Thank you so much. And she hands the pink dagger to him. I'm sure it was an honor to have my dagger in the hand of such a competent and well-armored hero. Ah, <laughs> shucks. Oh, Ooh, I need to get myself a set like this. And he knocks on her chest, believing it to be a chest plate. Wow. That tickles. <laughs> Frog walks into the tavern and sits near Farah, who's napping. She pulls out her journal and notates everything that just happened. Annika, the yellow-scarfed Mega Magic Paladin, walks next to Farah, touches her shoulder gently. Excuse me, sorry to wake you. By any chance, would you have my dagger? Yes. Farah takes out the yellow dagger and hands it to Annika. Thank you for taking such good care of it. Allow me to return a small favor. Sweeping her hand over your body, she casts a prestidigitation spell eliminating the spore layer that covers Farah, making the cot much more comfortable and much less itchy. Oh, thank you. You need time, and all of you are always most welcome here in Seatfeld. What are you writing, that old one? I'm just taking annotations about our journey, so I was writing about the cool fight we just had. And I'm trying to capture the magic of the poses we did to use the magic daggers. Wow. You did the poses perfectly. I have a question for you. How did Norbert handle himself up there? Oh. Frog puffs out her chest. Sir Norbert was glorious and brave and very smart. Timpani joins the conversation. He saved our pazookies on numerous occasions. Just five minutes ago, Farrah fell off a cliff and he caught her. And he was in pretty bad shape when he did it. He wielded that red dagger with great courage. Annika nods, 
and turns over her shoulder to look at Zora. I think he has proved himself. Yeah, it is time. Annika moves to a side table, opens up a secret latch underneath the drawer, and takes out a delicate little wooden box, which she pops open to reveal a beautifully crafted dagger with a white banded hilt. Norbert. Yeah? Norbert re-enters the tavern flanked by all of the other Mega Magic Paladins. We have a gift for you. Oh, for me? Your consciousness is the only gift I'd ever need. It is so good to have you back. It is good to have you back. Norbert reaches back to retrieve the red dagger and presents it to Zora. Zora takes it, bows gratefully, holsters it, and then holds out her other hand, holding the white banded dagger. Was this does? For me? This has been coming a long, long time. The legendary sixth mega magic paladin. I never thought this day would come. This is the happiest day of my life. And Norbert reaches forward gleefully and grabs the white hilted dagger. Norbert, roll a performance check. 10. A very faint white aura surrounds Norbert. The other paladins look around approvingly. I think it is time that we train you, Norbert. It is your turn to learn. I shall do my best. After a celebration with food, drink, and some rowdy wind gibbon entertainment, the Reeslayers take enjoys a long rest. And now for a brief intermission. What's up, everybody? It's George from the Reslayers Take. Hey, do you remember that feeling of your first critical hit? Or are you one of those people who are getting ready to start their first journey? I have a show for you. It's called Girls Who Don't D&D, because none of this all-female team of players had ever joined a D&D game before, or any other role-playing game. They go from learning which dice is what to challenging the gods themselves. They are surrounded by a beautiful and chaotic environment that has been described as a cross between Terry Pratchett's Discworld and Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it's a world you can be a part of, too. That's because their listeners perform pre-recorded sections that fit into each show. How cool is that? Those parts and the rest of the show sound amazing, with carefully added music and effects that bring a touch of the cinematic to your experience. I think the most amazing thing is that they were complete amateurs when they started, and you should really hear how far they've come. It really does make you feel like you're sitting at the table with them. You can join this group of unassuming Australians, otherwise known as the girls who don't D&D, on any device that lets you stream podcasts. But I'm warning you, this one is addictive, heartwarming, and heartbreaking, and very, very funny. And I hope you enjoy. Bye-bye! Oh, you guessed it, it's George, and I'm here to tell you about a new amazing podcast that you are going to love from HeadGum. In this improvised narrative role-playing podcast called Rude Tales of Magic, you will join artists, writers, comedians, all from Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, Comedy Central, Marvel Comics, and more, as they fight and fumble their way through this madcap and exceedingly rude fantasy wasteland of Cordelia. Branson Reese and his jester's retinue, Christopher Hastings, Carly Minardo, Tim Platt, and Joe Lepore, as well as Ali Fisher, star as a group of unlikely survivors, a talking crow, a lich in a wig, a bubbly fawn, a Sasquatch punk, and a tiefling hunk, who must solve the mystery of Polaris University's vanishment and return balance and higher education to their world. It's going to be very hard and very, 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 very rude. Whether you're a longtime lover of the series or a newbie to Cordelia, this tale is one you definitely don't want to miss. Subscribe to Rude Tales of Magic on Spotify. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes drop every Wednesday. Enjoy! What's up, everybody? It's your boy, George. Are you looking for more actual play podcasts? Well, there's never been a better time to jump on board with The Adventure Zone, the RPG podcast from the McElroy family. They're doing shorter seasons and campaigns now, so there are new stories more often, and it's easy to catch up if you come in late. Right now, Griffin McElroy is GMing a story for his brothers, Justin and Travis, and their dad, Clint. They're using D&D 5th Edition, the same game system as the Reslayers take, so it should sound pretty familiar. It's called The Adventure Zone vs. Dracula. And yes, these guys are going to take down Dracula. Hopefully. 
Find out by subscribing to The Adventure Zone wherever you listen to podcasts. And tell them George sent you. Now back to the show. The next morning, as the Reslayers gather their packs, Frog, make a perception check. Nat 20. As you are affixing your accoutrements, gearing up for presumably the trip back to Vasselheim, you look down at the compass gifted to you by Zella Blacktongue. Normally, the compass is gently spinning in a cyclical, consistent fashion. But as you stare down at it, the needle has come to a stop and is pointing in a very specific direction, further westward. Oh, something's happening. And Frog runs in the direction that it's pointing towards. Frog, Frog, where are you going? The compass! The compass? Do we have to run? Uh, okay, uh, Poogs goes to grab his backpack and quickly affixes it. Uh, Norbert, uh, I guess this is a little rushed, uh, but thank you for everything. We really appreciate you, and if you're ever in Vasselheim, please look us up. Okay, I'm coming! Train well, young warrior. It's been a heck of a couple days. Why don't we just walk? Fair. Here is still asleep in her cot. Her tail is wrapped around her, and she is sucking on the end of it like it's her thumb. Fair turns to Norbert. Do you have, like, a wagon or a cart of some sort? Oh, yeah. We've got a big one, and we call it the Zord. Uh... Any chance we could buy it off you? Oh, do you know what? Take it. We'll build another. Thank you. I appreciate that. Also, since you're, like, really strong, can you lift Kira and put her in the wagon? Oh, yeah, very gently. And Norbert will gingerly fold a couple of fingers underneath Hera and then, despite his size, is able to lift her up and place her gently into the wagon. Timpani heads to the front of the wagon, grabs the yoke with two hands, and pulls it. Farah turns her boots to the light setting and sits on the cart. Thanks for switching it to light first. As the Reeslayers take our leaving seat felt, the Mega Magic Paladins all assemble at the edge of the town. Waving goodbye to the Zord, they strike one final pose, all six of them together, sending an explosion of colorful energy out. The landscape changes as the Reeslayers travel further in a southwestern direction, approaching the Utaspire mountain range. But these mountains look significantly different from the ones surrounding the Hug Hive. Poog's old home. Wow, I haven't been to this part of Utaspire in a while. Timpani, I think, isn't this where? This is where you first tried to rob me on that glorious first day of our friendship. This is your origin. Yeah, I guess this is the origin of new Poogs. <laughs> it's where our journey began. Hey, uh, Timpani, I wanted to say I'm sorry. I got kind of mad before, but I know you're just looking out for me, and if you don't want me to fight stuff, I won't fight stuff. No, Pogues, it's me who should apologize. I just think I, uh... Well, I, you know, I don't like to admit this, but I think I got a little jealous. We've been traveling together a long time, and you've never asked me to train you. Train me? Would you train me? It would be my honor. It, just because I've chosen a pacifist life doesn't mean you have to do the same, but... I would love for you to see things from my perspective before you go on and, and train with everybody else. Yeah, I think that that's, that's fair. Sure. I, I definitely don't want to stab anybody else anymore. I think I've put that behind me, but I really think I can be an asset to the team in other ways. I think so too. And I think your drive to do that is something to be admired. And then after Timpani shows me stuff, are you guys still okay to show me some of the cool tricks you've learned along your journeys? Yeah, write this down. Your stance is bad. Your grip is too loose, too loosey-goosey. Uh, your breathing is like the breathing of an elephant. Uh, okay. You need to work on all of that. Posture, wrong, bad. Uh, footwork, wrong, bad. Uh, weapon choice, Wrong. Bad. It would also help if you were a little taller. Yes, be taller. 
Great, could you guys wait till I get a notebook to write all this down? I've written it for you. Oh, great. I promise I'll be a nicer teacher. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, Frog, do you think one of your pieces is this way? Yes, the compass activated and it's still working. The compass now points directly up to the snowy Utaspire mountain peaks, much less deserty than the southern tip of the mountain range. Poogs, you know anything about this side of the mountain? It's a high peak, so sometimes there's a lot of scary flying monsters moving around. It can be pretty dangerous over here. You want to open that book? Oh, good idea, Farah. Frog unstraps the monster tome and flips through it, looking for any entries involving the Utaspire Mountains. Roll an investigation check with advantage. 14. There are hundreds of entries in the Utaspire Mountains. Um, there are a lot, which can only mean that there are a lot of monsters over here. Farrell looks over Frog's shoulder, seeing if any entries are similar to any of the ghosts and spectral beings they've slayed previously. Roll an investigation check with advantage. 17. It is difficult to discern any differences between the entries, but one thing you do note is that the entries for the Slayers Take Slayings in the Utaspire Mountain Range date back to the very earliest days of the Slayers Take. This seems like one of their earliest hunting grounds. Lots of old bones to reanimate, do you think? I'm wondering if maybe we should also check in on our friend who made our weapons. Is nobody else worried about the lantern? Was that, is no, are we not, are we not worried about that at all? Oh, you're talking about the lantern, the one that Gert had. Yeah, uh, it seems that Heldwell maybe has it now. Is there any way to Stumstuck's house, lair, whatever that was from here? Nope, just in the Vesper Timberland. It's a really specific spot. Well. I think Hera's right. Timpany, why don't we try to make camp here for the night, and you can maybe go check on Gert, and we can just hold camp here, and you let us know what's going on. That way Hera has a chance to rest a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll have to rest on the other side after I tree teleport, but um, I'll be back tomorrow. Okay, um, this is a pretty good place to stop. It's going to be a pretty steep hike tomorrow to get up that mountain. Timpany quickly opens a portal in a nearby tree. All right, well, I'll be back. Be safe. I know you can do it. Timpany salutes and falls backwards into the portal. All right, let's get a little fire going. Anybody got any good ghost stories? Actually, I'm tired of those. Hira pulls her camping supplies out of her tent and begins to fashion a makeshift shelter using the wagon. See, I'm going to show you how to make Camp Market style your tents. They're all so bad. So all you want to do is... On the other side of the cart, Farah takes out her bedroll and fashions an improvised lean-to, gets underneath, and sleeps in the dirt. Frog sits down in front of Poog's fire, pulls out her tinkering tools, including Pumat Soul's fancy screwdriver, and works on her newly acquired dents and bumps. Poog's sits alongside Frog. Is your compass still pointing in that direction? Yeah, it is. Oh, good. Okay. I... I hope we don't lose the trail, but if we do, we'll keep looking for it. Thanks, Poops. I can only imagine what we'll find. How are you feeling about everything? I don't think we've really had a chance to talk, but it sounds like you got a lot of information all at once, kinda. (laughs) You're right. Poops, to know that you're... to know that you're a part of something greater is something I never expected. Can I tell you something? Uh, Of course, you can tell me everything, or nothing, whatever you want. Part of the reason that I've been thinking about wanting to train, Osisa basically told me in a very rhymey and kind of roundabout way that it was my duty to protect the Hug Hive. And that feels like a really big responsibility, and I'm just not ready for it yet. Oh, wow. What a noble endeavor. Pooks, I think it's really nice that you have this goal ahead of you. And I don't think you have to rush. I think when the moment is ready, 
You'll know it. Yeah. I want to protect the Hug Hive. It's full of people I really like. And it's my home. I just... Something's bothering me about some big, powerful sphinx telling me what I'm supposed to do. I don't think she even knows me. You know, Devexian, my new friend? Yeah, the metal guy. <laughs> yeah. The very <laughs> handsome metal guy. <laughs> yeah. What? What? You know, he said, the future is what we make of it. And Pooks, you're right. So what if a big <laughs> sphinx said something? The only person who can tell you what you need or want to do is you, I think. Or, or if you found like a really cool book that told you everything to do, then that might be nice too. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to find that book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Frog. You're welcome. Listen, I think you're doing a really great job and we'll just take it day by day. The day passes lazily, a much needed respite for the Reslayer's take. Hera's exhaustion points are reduced from four to three. And as night begins to fall, there is a swirling green portal that suddenly opens on a nearby tree and out steps Timpani. Timpani's face is white as a sheet. Um, well, I have some bad news. Are you okay? I'm okay. Um, not so sure about old Gert. I got to his tree door and, um... Well, the tree was burned down. So is he, like, stuck in there? I don't know. I couldn't get in. It... Literally the only way to get in there was through the enchantment that we set up together on that tree, and I can't get in there. You can't make another enchantment? Nope. I can't do it without him. That was part of the enchantment. You know, for his privacy. He's either stuck inside... Or... Maybe he... Torched the door so that no one else could get to him? Let me get this straight. You guys built a portal in a tree together and decided this will be the only way in and out. A tree that is very much flammable, cut downable. I hear the dripping sarcasm in your tone, Farah, but uh, we set up plenty of precautions against non-magical fire and any sort of natural occurrences, and it's been safe for a very, very long time. The kind of magic that I used to camouflage the door is really something only druids know about. You realize that one of the people that hates us the most right now is an evil druid. But the fact that Heldwell had the torch in his possession means that he definitely found Gert's home. Maybe he bought it. Would Gert sell it? I don't know, he gave us those for free. Gesturing to the spectral weapons. All right, well, if we can't get into Gert's home because the trees burned down, even though it's a long shot, Timpani why don't you try to send a message to him? Yeah, maybe I can get a message to him. Uh, Timpani looks up into a nearby tree and spots an owl roosting. Hey, you! Get over here! The owl looks to Timpani lazily and then drops off the branch onto Timpani's outstretched arm. I need you to go to Gert Stumstuck's house in his pocket dimension bog. Good luck. And say this. Timpani casts the spell Animal Messenger, allowing him to send a message of up to 25 words. Hey, Gert. It's me, Timpani Guff. Uh, you know, you really don't need to say your last name, bud. What? There could be no, other no, no, Timpanies. No. Oh, okay. Anyway, are you okay? How many words was that? Timpani, you got five words left. Stop. Noise lantern stolen. Uh, right. Timpani! Sorry. You got lantern? The owl abruptly takes off. What a nice message, Timpani. Yeah, I think that was the gist, right? Yeah, he'll know what I'm talking about. Do we have to wait here for the owl? Oh, it'll find me, and that was a pretty powerful animal messenger spell I just cast. Uh, as long as it's a week's journey or less, it should get to him. Yeah, she's not coming back for, like, a long time. Okay, so... Camp for the night, or head up while it's dark? 
I think we should wait for the sun. Why? Because the spooky stuff seems to come out at night. I feel like you're just saying that because you can't see in the dark. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> These glasses don't do much. Why do you wear glasses? Don't do they even do anything for you? Um. Well, my friend Delmi said that it might make me look less conspicuous. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But for that to work, you have to maybe not be like, oh, that tickles, and talk about how you are uh, metal all the time, right? I don't know. I'm not trying to judge, but like running through the town, going, oh, one of my pieces is over here. Look at me, everybody. I'm a robot. Maybe that's not. I don't remember saying that exactly. Watching here is not entirely untrue, but maybe a little unwarranted rant, and still having a little bit of fear after what he saw Hira do the day before. Timpani tries to get a read on where Hira is at. Timpani, roll an insight check. 10. Hira seems relatively tired, and you see some new markings peeking out from below her shirt line. Hira, I know this really isn't my place to ask, and I'm sorry in advance, uh, but what's going on with your markings? Timpani is referring to the wrapped chain markings that extend from Hira's left wrist all the way across both shoulders now to down her right wrist, like a shoulder armor piece tattooed on her body. Hey, I'm really sorry. Hira realizing that she was mean despite having the best intentions finally looks down at her hands. I was just saying you should be careful. And as she trails off, she takes off her cowboy boots. Hira, as you kick off your boots, you see above your hooved feet, at your ankles, the chain tattoo is indeed present, but it extends all the way up your legs, creating the image of full body chain mail. <sighs> well, you know, some people, they have to pay a lot of money for that. Whoa. Did that happen on the mountain? I thought we were all in silent agreement that we all have secrets and we're just like not gonna talk about it. I'm sorry, Farah, but I think that kind of went out the window when Hira commanded a bunch of chains to whip out of a portal and throw me into a wall. Well, Tiffany, I think the chains were protecting us so that we didn't get infernoed. All I know is I went down, then I woke up, and it was over. And if it takes a fire inferno to do that, I'm not going to question that. Thera, it was so cool. I get it. I get it. I wasn't there to see it. Do you want to see a drawing of it? Yes. Here. It's the scariest drawing Frog has done by far. Hira creeps out of her wagon tent, striding over to Frog and carefully shutting the journal. Why are we acting like we won? We did not win. Our weapons did not get stronger. And we are going into even more dangerous territory. And, and we almost died and did all of the work for Heldwell to outsmart us and take our reward. We lost. He's smarter than us. He knows more than us. We lost. We have to question everything from now on. Who we can trust, who's working with him. Okay, so what do we know so far then? We know that there's probably some underground brain network of mushrooms that's causing all of this to happen, ultimately controlled by the Timber Blight. Who is now in league with Heldwell? Do we need to destroy this underground network of mushrooms? Do we need to go after Heldwell? Do we need to go after the Timber Blight? There's a lot of things that we probably should figure out before we can win any fight. I really want to get this piece for Frog. We already journeyed like the whole day to get here. And it's really important to Frog and she's our friend. And I don't think bad things happening to us should make us lose sight of that. But what if we get back to Vasselheim after this is over and we go to the Slayer's Take and see if they have any information on Heldwell? I don't trust the Slayer's Take. Heldwell used to work for them. Currently all the helpful information we do have is because of the Slayer's Take and Kashavesh. You're not wrong. 
look, I've lived a very long time. And in my experience, no one gives you anything without something that they want in return. And if it seems like it's completely altruistic, they're getting something that we don't know about. And whether or not it's Kesha or it's that freaky sphinx that is ordering him around, there's something fishy about giving us this tome, giving us this house. How do we know that that house isn't being watched or observed in some way? Call me paranoid, but I don't trust it. And I don't know how you guys can either after what we went through with that giant cat. Vera, I hate to pull elderly rank here, but I've lived about twice as long as you have. And in my experience, the world is a pretty mean place. So when somebody offers you a little bit of kindness, you can't take it for granted. I think we can do both, guys, right? We can be grateful for the help and a little extra cautious. But for now, even though she was kind of a jerk, most of what Kasha and Osisa told us has been helpful. Kira starts to pull her cowboy boots back on, and as she does so, she says sullenly, I mean, I didn't trust her at first either, but everything she showed me has ended up being true. And she told me that the timber blight wasn't vanquished, and here we are. I can tell people a bunch of truths and manipulate them too. What did Osisa tell you, Farah? Nothing that's been true yet. That's all the details you're gonna go into? Yep. Okay. Well, aside from the Slayer's Take and Osisa, I trust all of you. And Hira, I'll take your words to heart. And maybe you can help me be a little bit more sneaky. Kira nods appreciatively, and plucking her egg from Poogs' backpack, goes and sits in her cozy wagon. Hira takes one acid damage. Hira still does not care. Hira, make a nature check. Seven. The egg appears cold. Ah! Ah! Hira, what? Poogs! What? What? I told you, you have to keep it close to your body and hug it like it's a baby. I did, it's perfectly fine. No, it's not as cold. It's supposed to be cold, it's a hook horror egg. A hook horror egg? Wow! Where'd you get one of those? Uh, there's an interesting little tiefling vendor in Vasselheim that had one, and I got it. Yeah, here, it's a hook horror egg. It's supposed to be hot in the daytime and cold at night. That's how you hatch them. Okay, I was doing it very wrong. And the egg twitches. Pooks, I could kiss you. I don't know how to feel that. Anyways, I can see a good place to hunker down up there on the ridgeline, just a little ways up the mountain. How about we camp up there, get to where the egg can be a little colder, and then we'll wait for the sun for the more treacherous part of the journey. The passes in the eastern Utaspire Mountains are no joke. Probably best to be careful. Timpani. I'd be happy to help you carry the cart. That's all right, Frog. I got it. Yes, mush. Slayer's Take is a Meta Pigeon production in partnership with and distributed by Critical Role Productions, developed in association with Hero Club. Game mastered and produced by George Primavera and Nick Williams. Featuring Nick Williams as Timpani Guff, George Primavera as Pooks, Jasmine Bular as Hira Agnihart, Jasmine Chong as Farah, and Caroline Lux as Frog. With special guest Xander Genere as Norbert Klott. Also featuring Danny Carr and Liam O'Brien as the Mega Magic Paladins. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. It is okay, also but, speak a message of up to 25 words. Uh, hey, Gert, it's me, Timpany Guff. Still the last name. <laughs> what? There could be other Timpanies. Anyway, are you okay? How many words was that? Timpani, you got five words left. Stop. Was Lantern stolen? Uh, right. Timpani! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Oh my god. <laughs> you got lantern? <laughs> <laughs> You got milk. We know he doesn't have the lantern. We know he doesn't have the lantern. We need to know what 